Tonight's Bible reading is from Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 1 to 7. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. This is God's word. Well, it's a, uh, it's a special day today, obviously, because it is Easter and we've come to celebrate, but it's also a special day because whenever we open God's word, we get to hear our maker speak, what he has to say to us. And we have that privilege again uh, today, tonight. So uh, with that in mind, let's pray together and ask uh, the Lord Uh, to meet with us and to speak, that we might be able to hear him. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time. It is your gift to us, and it is no small thing to open up our Bibles, the Word of God. And we have come to hear from you, to hear what you have to say. We've come to worship you. You have become everything to us. And so we just pray now that you would quieten our hearts and our minds. And Lord, may you summon our full attention. May you speak in such a clear manner that it will be unmistakable. And may we all know that we have met with God tonight. Lord, we pray that you would help us to behold Christ with eyes of faith. Help us to see. Help us to understand. And Lord, then importantly, help us to respond. We ask for the help of the Holy Spirit because we are so often dull. And distracted. So we commit our time to you, Lord. Be with us, we pray, and magnify your great name. Amen. Well, we're in uh, Isaiah 55 tonight, Isaiah 55. But I want to open with a, a question. Why do we chase after the same old things? Why, why are, is our lives marked by this relentless pursuit, a pursuit of more, a pursuit of obtaining, the pursuit of seeking fulfillment, something that will give us this lasting joy, this lasting happiness, this contentment. Why do we spend the money the way that we do? Why this unrelenting need for more and more and more? Why is that? We're all gripped by it. Why is that? It's because our souls are thirsty. It's because our souls are hungry. There is an aching and a longing deep within, and it's very, very hard to pinpoint. 
but also there is a gaping hole that resides in each soul. Every person that is born on this planet, a gaping hole, a gaping need. Now, why is that hole there? How did it get there? There's this yearning, this longing for something. How did it get there? Well, the beginning of our Bible tells us that when God made man and woman, he made them in the likeness of God. He made us to know him, to worship him, to have a relationship with our maker and to enjoy and delight in him. This is what we were made for. And then just after that, shortly after that, the man and the woman, they rebel against him. They defy him and immediately they are cut off from this relationship with him. There's no longer any intimacy. The life of God, they're cut off from him. And all of a sudden, there is this great fracture in the human soul. This void and this emptiness. And now, because there is this soul cut off from God, we hunger and we thirst and we look for something. But because we have been defiled by sin... We look to quench this thirst and this hunger anywhere and everywhere but God. And we look and we look. And tonight here in this passage, God says to us, let the search be over. Enough. Let the pursuit finish. And he has a wonderful invitation. He brings a wonderful invitation. So I want us to consider a few things about this invitation that you see here in Isaiah 55. The first thing, consider, consider the earnestness of the invitation. The earnestness. Now, the very first word in chapter 55 is very, very important. But the NIV and the ESV and a lot of translations, they get it wrong. Now, your, bio, your, your translation probably says the word come. It's not the Hebrew word for Come. It's literally, oh, oh, or alas. It it, it is literally grabbing the collar for attention. A modern equivalent would be for me to grab a whistle and blow it extremely loud. Say, everyone, listen. I want your eyes immediately on me. It's oh. It's almost a gasp and a sigh for attention. Now, it's true. In the, in the verse following, the word come, the Hebrew word for come appears another three times. But the very first word there is, oh, oh, listen, give me your attention. And this is how God wants to introduce his invitation. This is how he chooses to start. God's saying, I have something I want to say to this world, and I want a hearing. I want full attention. God is not indifferent about this. He doesn't sit back and just say, you know, I've got something that I think you might be interested in. And for some of you, I think you'll really appreciate this. And I, and I think this could really work out. No, no, he's not indifferent about our plight. This is an impassioned plea. Oh, people, he says. And God has something to say. And with his message, he wants to summon attention. And he wants eye contact. And so let me ask you this evening, before we move any further, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you awake? Do not think you've done your part just by turning up to the Easter service. God says, I've got something to say, and I want a hearing, and I want it with you. Are you listening? From the outset, we see an earnestness, an importance, and a waste, and, and, and haste here from God. He's not indifferent about us. And now, this impassioned initial introduction, it's followed up by three passionate pleas. Three times in verse one, he says, Come, come, come. Have a look at the text. Verse one. Oh, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Have you ever received an invitation in the mail and you're looking at it and you think, is this a pity invite? I mean, I mean 
does the host really want me there? I mean, will the party be any different if I don't turn up? I mean, why did I even get this? This is nothing like that. God is saying, come, 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 come. God doesn't sit back. God doesn't sit back at all. See, God doesn't wait. God doesn't wait for people to feel this kind of need for him or or when they're ready to maybe enter into a relationship with him. No, God comes down to us and he goes looking for us and he goes and seeks out us and he comes and he calls out, come. Why is this so amazing? God is not indifferent about our souls, but we are. Is not this world so indifferent about their souls? Think about our money. We fork out money for car insurance, for home insurance, for contents insurance, for travel insurance, even for life insurance. And yet people will hardly spare a single thought about their immortal soul and where they'll spend eternity. Not even scarcely a thought. And how opposite is God to us? He's not indifferent, but with an impassioned plea, he says, come to me, come, come, come. Are you listening? Are you listening? So we see the earnestness of the invitation, but we also see here who the invitation is given to. Who is the invitation given to? Look again at verse 1. Oh, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Who's the invitation for? All you who are thirsty and you who have no money. These are metaphors describing types of people. These are word pictures that he's giving us here. So we have to ask the question, who are the thirsty Who do they represent? And who are those without money? Who is that? Who's he talking about? Those who are thirsty. Is it those who have this thirst and this desire for God and they're looking for him and they're wanting him and they're ready for him? Is it them? Are they those who have this sense of need for God? And what about those who are without money. Is that referring to those who come to God and they look at him and they're empty-handed and they say, I've got nothing to offer you. You made this world. What could I give to you? Is that who it's referring to? I don't think so. I don't think that's who it's referring to. Not because of the context. Because in verse 2, it tells us that these people hunger for other things, not God. They have an appetite, but not for God in verse 2. And they do have money in, according to verse 2. Because he says there, why do you spend on that which will not satisfy? So they have some kind of income here. Who are the thirsty then? Who are these thirsty ones that he's reaching out to? This is every single human soul. What did we say at the beginning? We are thirsty. Whether you're religious or not, you are thirsty because there is a hole in your soul and you are trying to fill it with something because you're empty and I'm empty. The thirsty is everyone. We all want, we all need, and we all pursue something to quench it. We're all parched. Who are those without money? Who is that referring to? Those without money. Is that referring to the poor in society? It can't be. Again, verse 2. They have money that they're spending. So who is it? It's those who may have resources, but they have no money in the economy of God. Nothing. They cannot do anything that will truly benefit their soul. They do not possess the currency. They don't. It is a picture, again, of every single human born into this world by nature. Those without money. This is a bleak and miserable picture of humanity, isn't it? Those who are thirsty, parched, and those who have no money, they cannot help themselves. They cannot. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are helpless. We are impoverished. We are in great need. We are in the gutter and we cannot remedy the situation. 
It is a picture of man, man's condition. We are destitute and powerless. And yet this is exactly what makes the invitation so wonderful. So wonderful, is it not? God is calling out one and all, every single one of you, all, come. None are excluded from this call to come. No one fails to meet the requirement to come to God's kindness. No one fails to meet that requirement. Everyone is thirsty. And so he says, come, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Come, male and female. Come, slave and free. Come, young and old, whoever you are. You're all thirsty. Come to me. How incredible, how wonderful the breadth of the mercy in this invitation. Rightly did Paul say, how can we grasp how high, how long, how wide and how deep is the love of God in Christ Jesus. How wide is his love? It's wide enough for thieves. He saved tax collectors. How deep is his love? He rescues adulterers. He saved David. How high is his love? He forgives proud and wicked men like King Nebuchadnezzar. How long is he loved? Is his love? He forgives unworthy preachers. This is the invitation. As we look at this invitation, thirdly, let's consider what is offered. What's offered in the invitation? What do we see? Verse 1. Oh, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Again, look at these metaphors. Look at this imagery. He calls us thirsty. And what does he beckon? What does he offer? He says to the thirsty, come to the waters. Come to the waters. Do you notice the sufficiency that God has in his storehouses to meet our greatest need? He doesn't look at the thirsty in the parch and say, I've got a cup for you. Here, I've got a jug. Share it amongst yourself. He says, no, no, no. Come to the waters. Come to the waters. There's an abundance here. Our basic need is water, and God says he'll meet that, but he goes a step further. He doesn't just meet our need. What does he say? Come also buy wine and milk too. God doesn't just quench the thirst, but he blesses abundantly, and he heaps and he lavishes blessings. We know when we read in the Scriptures, wine is described as that which rejoices the heart. That enjoyment, the gift of God. And what about milk? Milk which nourishes us. A baby can live its first two years of life on milk alone. So nourishing. And God says, come buy wine. Come buy milk from me. Blessing upon blessing. Is this not what Jesus said? I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Everything you could ever need and want. Let's see, what else is offered? Well, there is a banquet of food that's implied. A banquet of food. Verse 1 says, come, buy and eat. And then when you go into verse 2, it says at the end there, eat what is good. Literally, in the Hebrew, eat the fatness, eat the best portion. So we saw that thirsting and having no money were metaphors. So what is the water then? Coming to the waters. What's that a metaphor of? That's our condition. What do the waters represent? Well, the passage itself explains and interprets the metaphor. Verse 1, come to the waters. What are the waters? Look at verse 3. Verse 3, give ear and come to me. Come to me. This is a call to come to God God himself is the banquet. He is the feast. He is what is needed. He is the one that quenches the thirst. What is this water that God gives us from himself for our thirsty souls? What is it? Isaiah told us back in chapter 12. He says this in chapter 12. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The water that God gives is eternal life. Now, this was God's, what we have here in Isaiah 55, this is God's invitation 
to the world, to the people through his prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah speaks the words of God and he's pointing people to come to God, to come to the banquet. But then, 700 years later, the unthinkable happens. A man walks on the scene and he takes these words, this invitation, and he holds up the invitation and he refines it. He refines the wording. And this is what he says. A man. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures said, streams of living water will flow within him. Do you see what Jesus is doing? Isaiah is pointing people and saying, come to God, come to God. A man rocks up on the scene and he says, everyone who's thirsty, come to me. Come to me. I'm here. The crowds knew Isaiah 55 verse 1. And the religious leaders knew Isaiah 55 verse 1. Who is this man that would equate himself with God? Who would call himself the banquet? Jesus knew what he was saying. Well, what's the food that he calls us to buy and eat? Come, buy, eat, eat what is good. What's that a metaphor of? Again, it's God himself and nothing less. This is the invitation of Isaiah the prophet Again, 700 years later, a man walks on the scene and he takes this invitation and he says the unthinkable. What does he do? John chapter 6, And Jesus said to the crowd, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. So when you look at this invitation in Isaiah 55, it is pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Easter message wrapped up 700 years earlier. And Christ finally comes and he says, I'm here, come to me, come, come. And doesn't the passage go on to confirm this? That it's about Jesus and what Jesus brought. Look what it says in verse 7. Second half. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon. Mercy and free pardon. Are they not the two things that Christ came? In his left hand he came bearing mercy. In his right hand he came bearing full and abundant forgiveness. This is the invitation that he gives. Jesus Christ is what God offers in the invitation. So let me ask you, the banquet tonight is spread out before you. It is spread out. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have you? Have you? God's talking to you. And he's spread himself out. Fourthly, as we look at this invitation, let's consider the prices on the invitations menu. The prices on the invitations menu. Again, verse 1. Oh, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. You see what he's saying? Without money and without cost. He's saying it's all free. It's all a gift, every single bit of it. God says, with this invitation, if you come, you must leave your wallet at home. It has no place at this banquet. Bring nothing. It is free. It's absolutely free. Now, this gives us great insight into the very heart of God, doesn't it? We see who he is. We see what kind of God he is. He's not a salesman looking at what he can get from us to try and sell us something and make a profit at our expense. No, no, he's not after that. He comes. He has no need of anything. He doesn't need anything from us. He is the one who has everything, everything to give. And he comes as the giver, wanting to give. We need to be so careful today as Christians 
how we, how we talk and how we use salvation language. When, when people say, I gave my life to Christ. Or we tell people, you need to give your life to Jesus. It's not what my Bible says. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He is the giver. We have nothing. He has everything and he gave it for us. He gave his son. And so God is saying, come, come, eat, come, drink, come to me. And come without cost and come without price. Without price. It's free and yet, is it not this very grace, this freeness that the world sees and uses as a reason to pass Jesus by? Is it not the freeness of the gift that makes people look at Jesus and keep walking? They believe that the gift is of little value because it's free. Think about it. I can have Jesus. I can have forgiveness. I can have it today. I could have it tomorrow. I could have it next year. Better yet, I can get it on my deathbed. Because of its freeness and its availability, men despise it. They despise it. And rightfully, God begins by saying, Oh, listen. And he's pleading in this, pas- in this passage. But the freeness of the gift, is that not the most beautiful facet of the gospel diamond? The freeness of it, that it is here and freely available. Do you see how beautiful it is? What do religions tell us? They're telling us, do this, do that, jump through this hoop and God will accept you. Make sure, confess your sins to the priest, take the sacraments, say the prayers, follow the pillars, do this, give to that, commit yourself. And God will accept you. And here God comes and he cuts through all of this man-made rules. He cuts through and he says, just come, just come, come to me. I have everything and it's completely free and completely without cost. Come. Understand, as we look at this world, you have Islamic suicide bombers who have been taught and raised that if they take their lives, it'll be a great gift to Allah and they'll be welcome into paradise because of the greatness of their offering. You have Jehovah's Witnesses who are taught to go around knocking on the door and the way to get into the kingdom is to make sure you tell people about the kingdom and so they knock with the hope that their labours will please Jehovah. And have that a little bit closer to home. You have countless people coming to churches, sitting and filling the pews, and thinking that by their mere attendance or the service that they offer and the roster that they sign up to, that they have earned brownie points and they have fulfilled their religious duties before God. Or you have the oneers who come to an Easter service once a year. And they've earned favor with God. There is nothing. God says without cost, without price. There is nothing you can bring or give. This is salvation by grace through faith. Wrapped up in the prophecy of Isaiah. God says come. Did you notice the strange way that he presents it too? I mean you look at the wording. What does he say? Come and buy without money and without cost. It's a strange way to say it, isn't it? It's, it's kind of weird. How do you buy something that costs nothing? Has God kind of muddied up his words? Is it kind of a bit of a typo? Did he kind of just missay what we know he's trying to communicate? Understand this. God didn't muddy up his words. And he didn't fumble and he didn't make a mistake. He said exactly what he wanted to say. What's he getting at here? God wants us to know That this gift, it's not just a collection. It's not just a handout. The purchase is free because the price has been paid. There is a cost. We are called to something that has already been paid for. Where does, what what are we looking at here? What's God communicating? What's What's the dilemma? 
In, in Exodus chapter 34, God says something about himself. He says this, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, but who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God says, there's, there's a payment for your sins. And then you go to Romans chapter 6 and it says, the payment for sin is death. And then you come to Isaiah 55 and he says, there's no payment. It's for free. So how does that work? How is that possible? Well, God can say this because of where the invitation comes. What did God say just two chapters earlier? We're in Isaiah 55. In Isaiah 53, he talks about sending a servant who will pay a great price. He will bear the transgressions of his people, it says. He was pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was cut off from the land of the living. And the payment, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. God says, come and buy without cost because the payment has already been made. The price has been paid. Jesus did it and he died for our sins. Well, we've considered the details of this invitation. But now God interrupts the offer and he interrogates the invitees. He interrogates and God asks the invited two questions, two very, very searching questions. He's already called for our attention and now, he wants, now he's calling for answers. Let's look at the two questions that he has. Verse 2. Why do you spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? The first question, he says, why do you spend your money on what is not bread? This is a metaphor again. He's using it. He's talking to a people who are starving and yet they're using their money for things that do not feed. Let me put you in a scenario here i want you to imagine for a second that you are homeless and you're living on the cold streets and you've been homeless and you haven't eaten for two weeks your life is fading before your very eyes and as your life is dwindling there in the gutter you look up and a soup for the homeless truck pulls up right in front of you and as the truck pulls in, you notice volunteers start to come out of the truck. And they set up a sign. They set up some tables. There's these big pots of hot soup there. And they put a sign out the front and it says, free soup. And as you're there looking all of this at all of this unfold, one of the volunteers starts walking towards you. And they're holding a bowl of soup, this steaming hot soup, and they bring it right to your face. And they're looking at you, offering it. And as they do that, you look at them and you begin reaching into your pockets and you're fumbling around and you can't believe it. You find in your pocket a $50 note and you pull it out and you're holding it and the volunteer says, no, 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 no. This is completely free. It doesn't cost anything. I don't want your money. And you look at them in the face and you say, this money's not for you. And with the little bit of strength that you have left, you get up and you stumble across the street and you walk into the tobacco shop and you take that $50 and you slam it on the bench and you say, give me a pack of smokes. And as you take the smokes, you walk back and stumble across the street, back into the gutter in front of that volunteer. And that volunteer is looking right into your eyes, staring at you. Has not that volunteer the right to say to you, why? Do you spend your money on what is not bread? And God looks out at every single person in this room. And he says, I want an answer. Answer me this. Why do you spend your money on what is not food? Why do you go everywhere but to me? Answer him. He's asking you. 
The second question he says, very similar. You see it there in verse 2. And why spend your labors on what does not satisfy? God's saying, I know all about your soul's longings. I know the gaping hole that's there. I know the thirst you have. And I know the desires that are there. And yet, why do you seek anything and everything for fulfillment but me? Why? And the world... Our world knows this. They they know our hearts and they know the hole in our souls and they advertise accordingly, don't they? What do you see in this world? What do all the signs say? You need a bigger house. You need a newer car. You need a bigger and larger TV. You need a new upgrade. You need more clothes. You need a relationship, someone whose hand you can put your hand into and walk with. You need children to fill your house. You need that job. You need those things. And God, he unmasks all of it, all of it. And he says, those things that the world promises, it's all all the happiness, all the contentment, all the satisfaction and fulfillment. God says, it promises that, but it's all a lie. It's all a complete lie. It presents as bread, but it's not food. It promises you satisfaction, but it will leave you empty. It will only numb the pain temporarily. And has not God clearly proven this? Has not God left us with a witness? I mean, think about it. Think about our world. What kind of day do we live in? We have more wealth than we've ever had before, more possessions, more things. We have easier access to pleasure and entertainment. We have everything we could ever want. And what do we see? We are more depressed than any other generation. We are more socially disconnected and lonely. We have more relationship breakdowns. We are more anxious and fearful than ever before. Children coming in droves, presenting with mental illnesses. We search and we search. And God questions us even tonight and says, Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? I want to know. I'm asking you, why? Why do you do it? God asks us, why we have gone elsewhere. And so the question comes to you, have you traded Jesus for 30 silver coins, just like Judas? Something more satisfying than Jesus. Have you done that? God says, I want to know. And he questions. But after he interrogates, God again holds out his hands and he pleads again. Look, look at verses 2 to 3 here. The second half of verse 2. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Do you see how many times, just in that verse and a half, how many times God says the word listen? Listen, listen, hear. Even on one occasion, he says, give ear to me. Literally he's saying, give me your ears. Give me your ears. Why is he saying this? Because there's so much noise. There's so many distractions. There's so many voices trying to get in our ears, telling us, come this way, come that way, come this way. And God says, give me your ears so you hear nothing but me. Nothing but me. Listen. Why else does he say, listen, 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 listen here? Why? Because we're such terrible listeners. We're such terrible listeners. We can't, we can't handle what God has to say. We think we know the best way. We think we know the right way. We think we've got our lives in control. We think we can set our destiny right. And God says, give me your ears. Humble your proud hearts and humble your proud ears. Give them to them. Give them to me so I may speak into them. Give them to me. And the result, what does he say? Hear me that your soul may live. Do you see the connection between hearing and eternal life? If you listen to me, you'll be saved. What did Paul say in Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing. That's what we need. We need to hear 
the truth. So as I wrap up, as you look at this, and as God's invitation goes out, do you say, Nathan, it makes sense. It's true. What he says, it's true and it's wonderful. I understand this. I'm guilty of the very things that you've talked about tonight. This has marked my life. But how do I come? The passage says, come to me, come to me, come to me. Okay, but how do I do it? How do I come to him? Well, he tells us here, look at verses 6 to 7. How do we come? Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. How do we come to God? Turn away from the way that we were heading. This endless pursuit of what cannot satisfy. Turn from that and come to him. Leave it behind. Come to him and he will freely pardon There's abundant mercy and compassion in him. And he will save and you'll have forgiveness of sins. Last night, late last night, I was sitting at the table. And and just thinking about in the backyard there, we've got a veggie patch. And I was just thinking about it and thinking, that patch, it needs water to live. It needs water to live. I can give it milk. I can give it honey. I can give it bread. I can give it all the things that humans need to live. But what does it need? It needs water. It needs water to live. Friends, look at this Bible. Look at the size of it. Look how big our Bible is. 1,189 chapters are in here. Do you know what God tells us in the very first chapter? What does he want to make clear in the very first chapter? I made you in my own image. Before you learn anything else, you've been made in my image. Stop searching for what cannot satisfy. You have an immortal soul and it cannot be satisfied except by the eternal Son of God. Let the search be over and come to me, he says. Come and live. Jesus says, do not labor for the food that perishes, but the food which the Son of Man will give to you. And that is the life that I give to the world. Do you have it? God is calling out to each person tonight. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is true and it is wonderful. We thank you for the offer of salvation that we have. We thank you for the gift of life that is in your Son. Lord, clearly in your word, you diagnose us better than any doctor, any surgeon, any specialist ever could. You know what is wrong in each soul. You know us better than we know ourselves. And we thank you that in your mercy and grace you've come to meet that great need to be restored to you, to have forgiveness for our sins. God, I pray for each person here that they would come to the banquet and come to Christ and gain life. And for those in this place who do belong to you, who are your followers, may you renew them with great confidence and satisfaction in Jesus, that they would no longer look over the fence, look elsewhere, but to drink from the wells of salvation that you give. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.